Thank you, Danny. Uh, you think I might be smoking something now? That I'm... <laughs> well, listen, I'm going to talk to you on the background of having done three residencies, three internships, three fellowships in different continents and different languages. I'm a survivor of surgical training. And uh, also in the presence of Dr. Bonnier, who is uh, probably one of the leading European uh, educators when it comes to general surgery. You know, when the residents or the applicants come to the Cleveland Clinic, and I'm a program director too, and they ask me, what's the theme of my residency? What's my goal? I always tell them that my goal is that they leave this program being safe surgeons and that they know how to operate. And when I trained, we didn't have hours, we didn't have EPAs, we didn't have milestones, we didn't have modules. The day started somehow and finished somehow, and we'd love to be in the operating room. We will never miss a case. If we heard that something was going on in the operating room, we would run there just to see, to observe that. So about 10 years ago, uh, after my training in Europe, Riogan Brenner came to me and said, well, we are working at the European Training Institute owned by industry that I'm not gonna mention now, on mental training with psychologists, with trainers, and so forth. And I want to share with you what is it that we are doing now at the Cleveland Clinic, and I hope that if the Executive Council approves, we're going to do it at the Fellowship Council. Um, surgical training was introduced by Dr. Halstead in the United States of America a long time ago at John Hopkins in 1889. And, uh, it was based on the German training system that I, I trained. And it was indeed, the more you do, the better you get at. The longer you are there, the better you get at. And it's true, you know, the more experience, the more we are confronted with an operation, within a situation, the more comfortable we feel moving there in everything we do in life. Um, and it was really based on sheer volume exposure. There was no curriculum. Uh, but the interesting thing is that 100 years later, we're still training like that in the United States of America. And what we heard from Corey, and we're going to hear from Rebecca Minter, and we are trying to do is to change that. So the challenges that we're having in surgical education in 2017 is that surgical education is rapidly changing. There is decrease in working hours, so you cannot stay as long in, in, in the hospital, in the operating room. The residents are limited to participate because of that in operations. There should be probably. Uh, minimal invasive surgery, you know, the lack of aptic feedback. We heard this morning the wonderful presentation from Dr. Bonier, how important that is. Robots, they make it even more difficult. And all this has created a big, big problem for us how to train our surgeons. So how about simulation? Well, simulation costs approximately a million dollars to renovate a place if you want to have a simulation center. And we saw this morning what Dan is putting together here at UT. That's very impressive. You need nearly half a million dollars to maintain that, about $311 an hour to have an FTE taking care of those who go to the simulation center. So how are you going to do that? One of the citations I have from the ACGME in my own program uh, is that we don't have a simulation center. And they keep, you know, it's my citation forever and ever. And I keep saying, well, but we're doing this mental conditioning. This is simulation for free. This is the cheapest simulation you can imagine. And um, that's what I want to share with you um, uh, when it comes to simulation. You know, Fitz Posner talks about the residents or anybody that wants to do something going through three stages, the cognitive, the integrative, and the autonomous. The cognitive stage is when you try to intellectualize a task but your moves are still erratic. You really don't know how to get it. You get frustrated, you get angry, you gotta train and train and understand the steps. The integrative step, the stage is when you have practice and feedback, you have knowledge, and you start really moving, and you see how you can put a stitch, and you see how good you are with putting a stitch. You're happy that you finally mastered that, that task. And then comes, and no interruptions, of course, and then comes the autonomous stage, where you, really, where you really can suture, but you don't need to be thinking about suturing. You think about the operation. Where are you going to resect? Where is the artery? Is your anastomosis going to be ischemic or not? So the stapling or the suturing, that motor task, is not anymore in your mind, because you know you're going to do it. So this has been used, mental conditioning, mental training, is not used by surgeons yet. And that's what I'm trying to change 
with a fellowship council, but it's used in many other disciplines. Top athletes manage distractions, the media, public expectations using mental training. We use it also in sports. Uh, you know, this is the German uh, uh, hurdle training team. They use mental training, and you see how they break down just running, you know, 100 feet, you know, all the steps they need to go through to get to that hurdle and jump over that hurdle. This is Heidel. She's the German national uh, champion, uh, Olympic champion in hammer throwing. Uh, and you see how she breaks down the throwing of the hammer with words. When she's sitting on the plane, she closes her eyes and she says, long, long, and left, right, left, right, sack, sack, jabba. And she does that on a plane. She doesn't need to be on the field. How often can we go to the simulator, to this wonderful training center that UT is putting together? Because the resident is tired, is in the OR, is in the ER, is on the floor, wants to go home. How often can she or he go there to train that situation that he or she is going to be facing the operating room? And she can do it all the time. She doesn't need a center. Uh, musicians do mental conditioning, believe it or not, because not every day is a good day for them when they play their instrument. And they ask themselves, is it really so that today I cannot play the instrument like yesterday? They close their eyes and they try to play the instrument while they're not doing it. The military uses mental conditioning. They use, this, they use it for post-deployment adjustment. So again, and you have the references down there. It is not just something happening today. It's happening for a long time. An aviation industry. Aviation industry uses mental conditioning. Sages gave me the opportunity to put a session on mental conditioning three years ago. And it was on Saturday afternoon at 5 o'clock when everybody was already on the planes. And I thought I was going to be sitting alone with this title. And there were like 50, 60 people sitting in the audience. And one of the attendees walks to me at the end and says to me, Raul, I want to thank you so much because, you know, when I was a child, I wanted to go and play with my dad on the weekends. And I found my dad sitting in the living room in a chair upside down with a helmet. And he said, leave me alone. I'm flying. He was a pilot, an airline pilot. So uh, what we share with aviation and sports industry are movements with high cognitive components, complex motor motions, and in situations of stress. I don't need to tell you how it feels when you're doing a laparoscopic surgery on the hiatus and suddenly you have a bleeding from an artery and you need to get that needle holder, get the suction, put the stitch, stop the bleeding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what is it that we learn from sports and aviation? What is mental conditioning? That's the cognitive rehearsal of a task without the overt physical movement. And it prepares oneself to find motor performances. It can be used for cognitive, kinesthetic, psychomotor, and technical skills. It is systematically being repeated without doing the movement. And here you see what you do. You describe the movement in detail because you have to help the resident understand what he or she is doing when putting a stitch or when doing an anastomosis. You describe the movement. You identify nodal points. Like an operation has different nodal points, dissection, resection, reconstruction, the approach, everything is a nodal point. Um, you then figure the making those nodal points, and then you rehearse those mentally. And it helps. You observe, you do subvocal training, you observe and train subvocally, and then you do the ideomotoric training. What you see here is a dynamic MRI. And if you pay attention in the, in the upper corner, you have the physical practice of moving the index finger. And see the signal that you get in the MRI. In the second one, this individual doesn't move his or her finger and closes her eyes. And you see the signal that you obtain that is very similar to the one when you're moving your fingers. And the bottom one is when you are with open eyes, you don't think about it, and you don't move your finger. So what this is telling you is that your, your central nervous system is capturing your idea, your training how to move that index finger while you're not doing it. It is not new. If you want to know when it started, you know, mental conditioning, imagining movements to trigger gentle motion, started in 1852. That was a German psychologist, Lotze. And there's been over 400 studies of mental training in sports. And since 1990, 
When we are sitting on those airplanes of British Airlines or Lufthansa, mental conditioning is mandatory for the pilots. So, uh, yeah, they, they, when we saw it this morning from Dr. Bonian when he presented the different steps of how a pilot has to land the plane. But they cannot do it all the time in the simulator, so there is a way they can do that without doing that task. And here you can see, you know, this is the required minimum level. This is certification. I did my fellowship, but I'm not an expert. How can I stay an expert when flying, when operating, when doing sports, when playing music? And that's where the simulator helps. But you don't want to be on a plane with a pilot that is here and needs to go back to the simulator. You always want to be sitting on a plane where the pilot is working at that level. How can we achieve that? And this is what I believe is the cheapest simulation we have available to us. See what happened in aviation industry when there was no selection of pilots, no internal training of pilots, no, no simulation at all. There were three, three fatal crashes per million flights. And see what happens to aviation industry after they started selecting their pilots, training the pilots with simulation, 0 0.2. So I'm going to show you now a video animation from Zullenberger landing on, in New York, uh, his plane on the river. And pay attention to the conversation between the pilots and the tower. The tower people don't go through mental conditioning. The pilots do. See the speed, the decision making. By the time they decided where the plane should land, Zullenberg was already landing or landed on the water. So pay attention to that because it's really uh, a clear example of what mental conditioning can do. If you can put the Jackie audio. 1549, Jack, this 1549 is to contact on maintain 1-5,000. Maintain 1-5,000, Cactus 1549. The moment he gets struck by birds, that's where it starts. Cactus 1549, turn left heading 270. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539, hit birds to lost thrust and focus. Returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading of uh, 220. 220. Tower, stop you departure, he's got emergency returning. Okay, it's 1529, he, uh, bird strike, he lost all engine, he lost the thrust in the engines, he's returning. Back to 1529, which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. Back to 1529, we can get it to you, do you want to try to land 1913? We're not able, we may end up in the Hudson. All right, back to 1529, it's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Okay, what do you need to land? Do you want to try to go to Teterboro? Yes, sir. Teterboro, uh... They keep Empire. talking, Actually, and he has to make decisions, Emergency one after the other. Cactus 1529 over the George Washington Bridge wants to go to the airport right now. Wants to go to the airport, check. Does he need assistance? Uh, yes, he, uh, it was a bird strike. Can I get him in for, uh, runway one? Runway one, that's good. Cactus 1529, turn right 280, can land runway right. one at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. Cactus 1549, radar contact is lost. You also got Newark Airport up at 2 o'clock in about 7 miles. Eagle 5, 4718, turn left, thing 210. 210, uh, 4718. Uh, I think he said he was going to the Hudson. Cactus 1529, uh, you saw him. So, how often do you think that Zullenberg landed on the Hudson with a plane? How often do you think that he was able to go through his simulator to land that plane on the Hudson. Isn't it, isn't it mind blowing how this guy landed that plane? So listen to the interview in 6060 of uh, Zullenberger. 90 seconds before hitting the water, 90 Captain Zullenberger made an announcement to the passengers and crew. Three simple words, brace for impact. I made the brace for impact announcement in the cabin and immediately through the hardened cockpit door, I heard the flight attendants begin shouting their commands in response to my command to brace. Heads down, stay down. I could hear them clearly, and they were, they were chanting it in unison over and over again to the passengers to warn them and instruct them. And I felt very comforted by that. I knew immediately that they were on the same page, that if I could land the airplane, that they could get them out safely. 
but there was still a big if. I was sure I could do it. You were? Yes. I was sure I could do it. Are we sure we can do it when we go to the operating room? Do we really go step by step every time we do our low anterior, our esophagectomy, our sleeve? Do we really think where we're going to put the trocars? What's going to happen if the staple line comes apart? How are we going to take care of that bleeding? We don't. We don't. Shouldn't we? That's the big question. Shouldn't we? Are those simulators, are those expensive centers that ACGME is demanding from us to have that are, you know, 20 minutes, an hour away from where we are working every day going to help us, really? And I'm questioning that that's going to be very helpful. So mental training significantly has improved sports and aviation. And there's also evidence that it can improve surgery. Um, it reduces stress. It optimizes movements. And it, there is improvement in the operating room. I mean, I started working with, um, with Jurgen Brennan at the European Surgical Institute uh, in the early 2000s. And you see here randomized controlled trials. And in the interest of time, I thought I'm going to have more time. We're going to go faster. All these status results are improvement in all criteria, significant task-specific checklist, very positive evaluation as beneficial additional traditional teaching. Stephanides, I can name you studies and studies and studies. And next time, when I'm going to have more time, I'm going to present you the results. I did it with my residents at the Cleveland Clinic. And I, I did it with suturing. The ones I put them through mental training and condition, and I explained them step by step what they were doing with a needle. Then I took the PGY2s and 3s that they were observing me for two or three years suturing. And at two weeks, I brought them back. And the ones who were going through mental training were faster, better knots, and they dropped the needle much less. So we all have those residents that watch us do the operation once and they go the next day and they do it. And we have the other ones that take longer. And there are those who would never master that. But it's not that they are not good residents. It's that they don't have that acuity to pick up the movements that we do to get the job done. And this is where mental conditioning comes all about, in putting those nodal points. These are the nodal points that my residents have with an appendectomy. And I ask them that. I'm on call nine times a month. And when I show up in the OR, they know they need to know those. And I asked them, how are you going to do that? This is a book we're putting together with Springer Verlag on mental conditioning. So in summary, we know that mental conditioning is around for a long time, has improved aviation, sports, music, the military industry. And I think we should, surgeons should implement that as well. It automates surgical procedures. It creates mental capacity and reserves and reduces stress. Thank you very much.